Um, good morning, everyone. I will pass it over <laughs> to um, Elizabeth uh, P.S. Briere to kick us off. Thank you for joining us on a Friday. <laughs> Bonjour à tous. Good morning. Avant de commencer, je tiens à souligner que nous sommes réunis sur le territoire traditionnel et non cédé de la nation algonquin Anishinaabe. Bienvenue à cette conférence de presse. Welcome. Veuillez noter que les médias auront la possibilité de poser des questions après l'annonce. My name is Elizabeth Briere. I'm the Parliamentary Secretary to Minister Yara Sachs. And I am joined today by my colleagues, the Honorable Yara Sachs, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and Associate Minister of Health, and the Honorable Yassir Nagvi, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. We are pleased to be with you for this important announcement, which will provide a critical step forward in addressing the overdose crisis and substance use affecting communities across the country. With the launch of Health Canada's Emergency Treatment Fund, municipalities and indigenous communities will now have access to crucial support for recovery programs and arm reduction services. This fund is a direct response to the urgent needs they face, helping to strengthen their capacity to save lives in the midst of this, this growing public health emergency. Maintenant, c'est avec fierté que je vous présente mon collègue, l'honorable Yassir Nagvi, secrétaire parlementaire du ministre de la Santé. Yassir a été élu pour la première fois comme député d'Ottawa Centre en 2021. Il a précédemment exercé les fonctions de secrétaire parlementaire du président du Conseil privé du Roi pour le Canada et ministre de la Protection civile. Croyant en l'importance de redonner à la communauté, M. Nagvi a été député provincial en Ontario pendant 11 ans. Durant cette période, il a occupé les postes de procureur général de l'Ontario, leader parlementaire du gouvernement, ministre de la Sécurité communautaire et des services correctionnels et ministre du Travail. En tant que membre de la législature de l'Ontario, il a milité pour les services publics et la croissance communautaire durable. Mr. Nagvi has sat on the boards of many community organizations, including Art Kitsra, United Way East Ontario, and the, the Ottawa Local Immigration Partnership. Please join me in welcoming P.S. Nagvi. Merci beaucoup, uh, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Thank you very much for all of us for being here, joining um, uh, Elizabeth Breyer and Minister Sachs. Uh, this is a very important issue for all our communities across the country. The overdose crisis and the toxic drug supply that fuels it continues to devastate communities across Canada. From small towns to big cities, there is no place that has been left untouched. Every community has suffered tragic loss of life. That puts municipalities right on the front lines. Every day, they come face to face with the social and economic consequences of the overdose crisis. There is enormous strain on key services like emergency response, public health, and housing. I hear that from my city right here in Ottawa on a regular basis. We know that our cities and towns need more support, and that's why we are here today. So with that, I'm proud to welcome my colleague, the Honorable Yara Sachs, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and Associate Minister of Health. Minister Sachs was first elected as the Member of Parliament for York Centre in 2020. She's a longtime community advocate and leader focused on building health and resilient communities. Before entering politics, she was a Director of Trauma Practice for Healthy Communities, a Toronto-based mental health charity working for better access to mental health services. There is no better person, in my opinion, dealing with this crisis right now in our country than Minister Sachs. Minister, to you. Thank you, and uh, bon matin, bonjour. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, P.S. Uh, Elizabeth Prier and P.S. Yasser Nakhvi, and for joining us on a Friday. Um, and really, thank you for the kind introduction. I will be frank. There is not a single community that has been left untouched by the overdose crisis. Um, we've heard from families, communities. Um, it is the discussion at many kitchen tables across this country each and every day with the loss of loved ones and the deep concern of loved ones, neighbors, and friends who are struggling under the weight of substance abuse addictions in the face of an illegal and ever-changing toxic drug supply. 
the impacts are felt across the country and it's been felt by friends, families, neighbors, and so many communities that I have met with and spoken to from coast to coast to coast. And too many Canadians, too many Canadians have lost their lives to this public health crisis. As the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, I know that we need to use every single tool at our disposal to connect people to health care. They need health care because we save lives through health care. And we need to get those who want the help and need the help to get the help to them where and when they need it. Communities across the country have asked for our help and let me assure you here and now that we will be there with all partners because everyone deserves access to the services and supports that work for them. And while no community has been left untouched by this crisis, some communities have been more deeply affected than others. So today I am pleased to announce the launch of the first call for proposals to the Emergency Treatment Fund. This is a $150 million fund that will help municipalities, First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities rapidly respond to their unique needs. It will provide assistance to where it will make the most impact and help support a wide range of projects and services to respond to the urgent situation being faced on the ground. Communities know best what they need in the face of this crisis. Some of the examples of what we've heard so far that can be needed would include in urgent recovery programming, on the land healing, harm reduction supports, such as naloxone distribution and drug checking equipment. We will be there to support communities so that they can quickly increase access to and have the availability of substance use services to improve their community capacity. We need to be able to scale with communities quickly, to be able to respond quickly and to answer the need and the calls that have been made quickly because lives are on the line. Applications to this call for proposals will begin now and be accepted until November 8th. This is, will be the first call of proposals of other continued calls that will happen through the duration of this fund. This funding along with the dedicated work of those working on the front lines will make a real difference in communities right across the country. We know that there's no single solution to addressing this crisis and there's no single organization or single level of government that can solve it alone. But what I will say is that I know that there is hope Communities truly do know best what they need to save lives and meet the needs of those struggling in addictions in their communities because they are their neighbors, they are their families, they are their loved ones and friends, and they are also the dedicated healthcare workers, outreach workers, peer support workers, and so many more who are working on the front lines on the ground every day in communities doing this life-saving work. I'm confident that the Emergency Treatment Fund will directly help and support the services needed in communities quickly and effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, P.S. Magni. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I will now pass the floor to the moderator for the Q&A with the media. Okay, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Um, we'll start with the room uh, with Stephanie Taylor from the National Post. Hi there, good morning. Uh, good morning, Minister. You talked about um, there's been different tools to tackle this crisis. Do you think that involuntary treatment for minors uh, and prisoners is uh, a tool? And is that a tool? Do, do first, do you see that as a, a viable tool to this crisis? And second, is this a tool that your government supports? Um, thank you for the question and what I will say is that certainly at the federal level we have four key principles of what tools are in addressing the overdose crisis. They include prevention, they include treatment, they include harm reduction and treatment is only one of the many tools but what we know right now is that jurisdictions across this country do not have enough treatment beds available for individuals to choose to access at this time. They do not have enough services and supports in the treatment space. I'm focused on that. 
We've signed $200 billion worth of bilateral agreements, which have a component for mental health and substance use to address addiction services that are needed. Um, and we will work with provinces and jurisdictions to make sure that they are providing access to those treatment beds. This is health care. I am not here to do anything more than emphasize that we are saving lives through health care supports and services, which include treatment. And that the health care is a charter right. It is to help people with in a space that they need dignity and assistance in their most vulnerable moments, and that is where we should be focused. Uh, I, I guess, what do you make of policies that would put somebody in treatment, be it a minor, be it a prisoner, be it an adult, who does not want treatment uh, for their addiction? What do you make of that policy? Because that is the debate that is happening in jurisdictions. So what do you make of the policy of putting someone in treatment who maybe doesn't want to go there uh, and would have to do so involuntarily? Well, at this point in time, uh, the leader of, of the opposition isn't talking about policy. He has contemplated his own perspectives uh, based on a very polarized and a lack of evidence-based view of what we know works in a continuum of care for those who are struggling with substance use. If I may, though, this has come up uh, in, in British Columbia, uh, even EB, uh, <laughs> Premier, who's trying to get re-elected, has talked about this policy as have Alberta, as have others uh, beyond Mr. Polyev. So I'm just wondering if the federal, if you as the minister can, can state the position as to what do you say to policies that say, I want to put someone in treatment against their will? Well, what I'll say first and foremost is that health care is the purview of the provinces to address. It is their jurisdictional responsibility to outline the policies that they see fit. However, what I will say, what we've seen in British Columbia is the work of Dr. Vigo outlining very specifically that those, those who they contemplate as eligible for involuntary treatment are people with extreme complex needs that have been pervasive over time that require really a full range of supports from the healthcare system. So I would encourage British Columbia or any other jurisdiction to first and foremost, before they contemplate whether it is voluntary or involuntary, that they need the actual treatment services in place, which currently they don't have. All right, thank you. And we'll go to Alessia from the Canadian Press. Hi, um, your department has said it's difficult to pin down how much of the federally funded safe supply of drugs is being diverted into the community. Uh, but as listening to stakeholders like the police, what were those stakeholders actually telling you about the diversion of safe supply? So this, thank you for the question. Um, when we talk about uh, prescribed alternatives and diversion of prescription medicines, we're not talking about the same thing for, to, to begin with. Diversion is illegal. We have said that time and again. And when we talk about diversion being illegal, it is of any prescribed medication. That could be ADHD medication. That could be pain medication that someone has acquired post-op from a surgery in a hospital and goes home with. And diversion of any medication that is not for its dedicated use is illegal in this country. Uh, when it comes to the pres prescribed alternative uh, treatment models that have been put in place of which uh, 4,500 Canadians are in are part of a federally funded uh, federally supported programs for prescribed alternatives we've put in very robust mitigation measures to ensure the safety and use of those treatment services but again health is the purview of provincial jurisdictions we have worked with them very carefully on guidelines of how to administer and prescribe uh, rapid access to addictions medicine and it's up to the provinces to ensure that their physicians are well trained and well supported in providing supports for their patients and clients who are seeking help with addiction. And I understand that you're not the public safety minister, but the ministers of Indigenous Services and Crown Indigenous Relations always speak about how there needs to be a, a whole of government approach to those issues. Um, one of the uh, biggest things that chiefs talk about is the lack of police in their communities to stop drugs from coming in. Do you see that as a problem and are you working with public safety to get First Nations police, policing legislation off the ground to tackle issues like the, the drug crisis? Um, there is no question that when we look at uh, the four key principles of how we're going to address this 
this overdose crisis and the illegal toxic drug supply, that enforcement is a key piece of the puzzle. But we also know that the war on drugs failed. We also know that we cannot but that's legisla what we can't legislate. We can't legislate and enforce. It's self-determined that they want police there to be like having checkpoints there. That's uh, the self-determination of communities. I don't know if they would consider that the war on drugs there. I, w uh, if you allow me to actually answer the question, what I was going to say is that an enforcement piece is an important piece of the puzzle, and we recognize that, and have been working with our public safety counterparts to ensure that those discussions are ongoing to provide those supports, but they are only one piece of the puzzle in helping communities heal and push back against the overdose crisis. All right, thank you. We're gonna move over to the questions that we have on Zoom, uh, starting with Mackenzie Gray from Global News. Mackenzie, if you can unmute. Uh, Prime Minister Sachs, uh, I'd just like to go back to Stephanie's question before. I didn't hear a clear answer, so I'd like to give you another opportunity in this. Uh, does your government support provinces using involuntary treatment for folks who have drug addiction problems? In terms of administering their health care, as we are always committed to do, but as I said previously, uh, I haven't seen enough of a move of scaling to need of treatment by provincial and territorial jurisdictions to meet the moment. And before we talk about involuntary or voluntary treatment, I would like to see them utilize and access the robust $200 billion worth, worth of health care agreements that have been signed across the country to dedicate resources to this. This is about political will in allocating the resources that they have to providing treatment access to those who need it in, in a way that is timely and accessible and by accessible, I also mean low barrier access for those who need it most. Um, Minister Freeland got asked about this yesterday. I'd, I'd like to read back uh, what she said to us when we spoke to her. Uh, and this is a quote. We have to be sure people get treatment they need. And sometimes a person can be too sick to really recognize what treatment they need. Do you think that that is a situation across Canada where people could be too sick to understand that they need treatment? I think that these are decisions that individuals make with their health care providers and with their families and loved ones and, and the care that is needed for them. And I think that's where we need to keep it focused from a human-centered lens, from a compassionate lens, and from a health care lens. All right, thank you. We'll move on to Marina von Stackelberg from CBC. Hi there, Minister Sachs. You talked about uh, proposals opening for this program, and I'm curious as to when you expect money to actually flow to these communities. The first round of proposals will close November 8th, and it is our anticipation for funds to flow as quickly as possible before the end of the year. Uh before the end of the year. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to go back to the involuntary treatment question again, because I, I do think that it's important to get a clear answer from you. You know, the NDP and the Conservatives in BC are both proposing this. They say that this is part of a bigger treatment plan, but that it is something that they feel is necessary based on the crisis there. So do you, as the minister, support involuntary treatment? As I said before, and I'll reiterate again, um, before we contemplate voluntary or involuntary treatment, I would like to see provinces and territories ensuring that they actually have treatment access, scale to need. They are not there yet. They have the resources and tools to do it. We are there to partner and collaborate with them to make sure that those systems are built out to meet the need and to meet the moment. And that is where my priority lies, is making sure that access to treatment is readily available in a timely manner without wait times and without losing more lives. Okay, thank you. Um, those were all the reporter questions that we had. Um, if you have more time, I'm willing to open the floor again. Um, but we could also, if you have to... We have... Um, yeah, we have a few more minutes if there are any more questions. Perfect. I'll uh, hand it back to you, uh, Steph Taylor. From thanks for thanks for sticking test. around. Um, you talked about what you're hearing from stakeholders in terms of the, the harm reduction. You talked about uh, drug testing. You talked about naloxone. Do you think Canada needs to expand its uh, pharmaceutical alternative programs and or expand the uh, number of supervised uh, drug consumption sites, which are other harm reduction tools? Do you think the, the country needs to expand kind of those two latter ones? So 
I am a firm believer that harm reduction is healthcare. Harm reduction does include safe consumption sites. Um, uh, it is uh, concerning to me that this is becoming part of a polarized debate when we know that safe consumption sites just alone here have reversed 58,000 overdoses since 2016. Um, we know the evidence shows that safe consumption sites work in community. They uh, not only save lives, they are the access door for individuals who struggle with substance use to get primary health care, to begin to contemplate treatment and, and access to other tools and resources to get them to a better place in managing their addiction, but also being able to get into programs. Um, when you close that door, we lose lives, we lose people because the truth is that if we don't have a harm reduction piece to our strategy, then people will die alone. We know that these are the facts. And we also know that when they come to safe consumption sites, there is a reduce in criminality, there is a reduce, there are reductions in um, individuals using elsewhere in unsafe environments. But again, this is about political will. We see other jurisdictions who ensure that safe consumption sites and prescribed alternative um, clinics are well-funded, well-resourced, and well-staffed, and work directly with community on engagement to ensure that there is a clear public safety lens on this so that families in community feel comfortable and safe going about their day-to-day -day business, but also a public safety component for people who, who struggle with substance use. They also need to be safe. So from the federal government's perspective, we will continue to work with jurisdictions to provide best practices, best models, and best resources available from what we know from jurisdictions around the world where models have worked. And we encourage them, again, to use the resources that they've been provided, to find the political will, to not look away from people who are struggling and dying to get them the health care that they need. Are you, you suggesting that Canadians who uh, take issue, whatever that issue may be with, uh, say, uh, this, this supervised consumption site in their neighborhood or the prescribing of, of pharmaceutical alternatives um, to those who are struggling with addiction, that if, if they're seeing um, issues stemming from those policies, they should take it up with their provinces and local jurisdictions versus the feds? Again, we work collaboratively with every level of government to ensure that the health care services that are being delivered are being delivered um, with a clear lens on both public health and public safety. Um, but jurisdictions are responsible for the health services that they provide. We continue to provide guidelines and standards. We provide the regulatory structures for safe consumption sites that are adhered to by the operators. But yes, provinces and provinces have a key part to play in this, and uh, we are here to work with them. If I, if I may, people that I, I speak to, and all of us do this, they see the crisis in our communities, and they want their governments, all three orders of government, to help people. And they also recognize that healthcare is delivered by healthcare providers. And so we need to utilize, as the minister said, all tools necessary to provide that care. That includes prevention, that includes harm reduction, that includes treatment. And any politician who's not a healthcare expert, by the way, tries to politicize any element of those approaches is really playing with people's lives. And we have to avoid that. We need to make sure that we're working together. This fund is an example of how we are going to be working with indigenous communities and with municipalities in making sure that they have the necessary resources available to be able to provide those key services. This is, this is about saving lives, period. And we need to use all approaches, all methods, told by experts, because they are the one who knows best to save lives. Um, Alessia, do you have another question? I can pass my question on to staff or if anybody else online. Okay, perfect. Um, I might just go to Zoom. I'll just check with Marina. Um, Mar Marina from CBC, do you have any other questions? Your hand is still raised. Oh, I love when I do that. Keep the hand up. Um, yeah, I just <laughs> I just wanted to ask, um, especially about um, the stuff about vaping, 
there were health groups that came out last week and Minister Sachs, they, they went pretty far and they said that they think you should resign over a lack of movement on vaping. Just, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on their concerns and their call for you to resign. So um, I do believe I'm going to be speaking to you a little bit later today about this, Marina, but um, if you'd like to talk about it now, what I will say is this, um, this government has made it very clear and I have made it very clear in the many meetings that I have had with youth vaping advocates, including the ones who were on the podium last week. We've met with them multiple times over the course of uh, my tenure and also my predecessor. And uh, the discussions have been ongoing. I'm really solutions oriented. I'm not really interested in political uh, press, press release stunts when uh, folks who were up here last week on Friday knew perfectly well that they were meeting with me this week. Uh, so my, my approach to this has always been that we are looking at the health of Canadians first, particularly uh, young people. I say that both as the minister and as a mother. But in a solutions-oriented approach, we also know that in jurisdictions like Quebec and in Australia where they have pulled flavors from the shelves, there is an illicit market that has cropped up that young people continue to access. In Australia with a prescriber model that they've put in place, um, the illicit market is flourishing. So as we move forward in getting the regs right, I would encourage those who are very important advocates in this space to continue to collaborate with us so that we get a solutions-oriented approach rather than press conferences. Follow up, Marina, and then uh, we'll end it there. I'm good, thank you. All right, well, we'll end, uh, that'll conclude our press conference. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, take some additional questions. Yeah. Thank you.